Good evening. It's good to see everyone here tonight. We appreciate uh, everyone's presence. We have some visitors. We're grateful for your presence. Um, we'll get started um, right after our opening prayer. Brother Mike Preston is with us, and so we've been doing a wonderful job this week. We appreciate him. Um, the children are already in their uh, classes, starting their uh, classes tonight. And so, once again, thank you for being here. If you would, please bow with me. Dear me, Father, we come before you, Father, this evening. We praise your holy name. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to come together uh, to study from your word, Father, and to have these classes and these studies and to praise you and to honor you. Help us, Father, as we are about to engage in this study tonight. And please be with Brother Mike as he stands before us. Help us, to, all of us, to be engaged, Father, and to listen attentively and to make application in our lives, Father, and to um, look at the evidence that's found in your word. Please help us, Lord, and be with us. We thank you for uh, each and every person we have here tonight. Please uh, be with us and help us. And be with those that are hurting and suffering, those that are not able to be out with us, Father. Please help them and be with them. Be with us all now in Christ's name. Amen. For the mic. Good to see each and every one of you. We're going to be studying the topic that we have been assigned is the topic of evolution and how it compares with the biblical account of creation. One of the things that you have to understand you don't have to, but it works better, <laughs> is that when you are looking at a particular topic, usually everything about that topic is not absolutely wrong. One of the points that we try to drive home in regard to denominationalism is that in the denominational world, everything that's taught in the denominational world is not wrong. But the parts that are wrong really make a difference. The same thing could be said probably in any study of any topic that would contain itself in God's Word. And the reason that is, is because you're going to either have to go to God's Word when you talk to people about a particular subject that has its footprint in the Bible. Where do men come from? Well, Genesis 1. But the evolutionist says no. But the evolutionist knows about Genesis 1. And so, whatever topic you're talking about, if that topic contains something that's oriented biblically. The odds are that some of the things that are being said might actually be right. And that's where the dilemma falls. And that reason that that's where the dilemma falls is the separation from, you've heard the old expression, you can't see the forest from the trees. They're the same thing. But the fact of the matter is when you draw the distinction, there becomes a distinction that whether real or not has been made by an observation of somebody that's trying to prove something. Tonight I want to start talking about dinosaurs, and that's what our topic is tonight, in the book of Genesis, the first chapter. Now, we are going to start with the presupposition that we're going to go to God's Word to find truth. And we're going to go there because, as we've already discussed in this series, evolution or creation are accepted by faith. 
we have talked about objective faith. An objective faith is a body of evidence that is given to you that does not originate with you. Subjective faith, subjective faith is what comes from you after you accept whatever objective faith you have. The same is true in regard to a lot of topics, but especially the two that we're looking at, creation and evolution. Now, the reason we're going to start in the book of Genesis is I hope that you will see this in just a minute. We're going to go to Genesis, the first chapter, and we're going to start reading in verse 20. Then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the sky. So God created large sea creatures, and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water, according to their kind. If you have your own Bible, well, it doesn't matter whose Bible you got. Go ahead and underline it. Be good for them, too. According to their kind. What does that mean? It means kind produces kind. And that's what the text is beginning to introduce to us. He also created winged creatures according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters of the sea, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, and then morning, the fifth day. So here we have a day in the creation, the fifth day, where God creates what are kindly referred to as sea creatures, and birds or flying birds or creatures on this day. So he's created things that live in the sea and things that live in the air. There's not much more told to us about that than that's what they were. Now, let's look at verse 24. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kind. Livestock, creatures that crawl, the wildlife of the earth according to their kind, and so it was. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. So on day six, we have the creation of, you know, animals that live on the earth. And they were produced after their kind. Now, let's start in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Now, again, if you have a Bible, this last verse is pretty important in the day and time we live, and that is that God created male and females in his image. Now, what does that mean? It means there's two genders. It means God created them that way and it means that they were created in the image of God. They were living souls. We're not gonna take a lot of time to talk about this, but this passage of scripture talks about God creating them. And if you keep reading, you'll find out that God took from the dust of the earth and formed a man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now what that means is nothing else was a living soul because the breath of life was not breathed into these other creations, but they were with man. When I was a kid, I had a Bible school teacher 
And uh, actually, we were talking about Daryl Haub a minute ago at y'all's house at the Watts, and I was talking to them about Daryl Haub. This was Ann, his wife. And Ann said, the reason that we're created in the image of God is because we walk upright. And I came home and told my father that that's how we were created in the image of God. And he said, who told you that? And being the trustworthy person I was, I said, Ms. Ann said it. The older I get, the more I find out that's not true that we walk upright because I walk like this a lot more than I used to. I always used to tease my father and I said, did you find any quarters down there? And he said, shut your mouth. But it wasn't that man walked upright or that he had a brain or that anything else. The reason they were created in the image of God was because they became a living soul. And, and that's the creation. Now, what I want you to know, day five, God created sea creatures and things that fly. Day six, God created animal life and per particularly land animals. Day six, he created human life that were created in his image. Now, if you will, just file that away for a moment. We're going to come back to it. I want to tell you why the Bible was written. So we're going to be here a long time. I want you to turn over the book of 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul, if he, we talked a little bit about Paul last night, if he be the writer of the book of Hebrews, he writes over half of the New Testament. If he's not the writer of Hebrews, he writes almost half of the New Testament. Pretty significant person in regard to Revelation. 2 Timothy 3, the writer reveals in verse 16, Paul says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. There's a couple things you need to notice in this verse. Number one is the scripture is inspired by God. Do you know what the word inspired means? It means God breathed. And so when you look at God creating man and Man became a living soul because God breathed in the man the breath of life. And man became a living soul. It's only suitable that those people that were created in the image of God by having the breath of life placed within them be guided by a word that is God-breathed. Guess what? Animals, birds, flying creatures, creatures of the sea are not dictated by anything like that. We talk about instinct sometimes when we talk about animals. I remember we had a schnauzer. And we were living in North Carolina. And that schnauzer was going to have puppies. And I was studying with somebody, and the only time they could study was in the afternoon from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. And I was over at this person's house, and Cindy called. And she said, the dog is shredding up paper. And I said, I told you to cancel our subscription. She said, don't be funny. I think that means she's ready to have puppies. I said, where is she? She said, she's in the bathroom. I said, close the door. With the pup, with... With the dog in there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Close the door. And she said, well, she's fixing to have puppies. I said, are you going to help her? No, that's why I'm calling you. I said, I'm not going to either. Close the door. She closed the door. We didn't have cell phones back then. When I got home, she said, she's still in there. I said, can you hear her? She said, yes. 
I said, what does she sound like? She sounds like she's in pain. Everything's going fine. <laughs> the interesting thing was after all this, this schnauzer had a baby schnauzer that was almost the same size as her. Just one. But guess what? She made it through it. She never had had a puppy before. Cindy was absolutely no help. I couldn't even hardly get her to shut the door. But guess what? She knew how to do that. Because she had the breath of life in her? No. Because she had instinct that God gave animals. And so there's a differential scene there. But when we come back to 2 Timothy 3, and it talks about this God-breathed scripture, guess what that God-breathed scripture is good for? To make us complete and to equip us to do everything we need to do. You ought to read this verse every day. You ought to put it up on the refrigerator, put it up on the mirror where you get dressed in the morning. Every scripture is inspired by God. He breathed it himself so that we could have everything we needed to be what God wanted us to be, complete, able to every good work. Now hold your finger there and turn over to 2 Peter, the first chapter. Second Peter, the first chapter, this is the Apostle Peter writing. And in verse 2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted everything to us pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. By these he has granted unto us precious and magnificent promises, in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world with its lust. There's a battle going on for you. God's given us everything that we need. This passage of scripture right here says he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And there's two different things there. He teaches us how to live in this physical world. And he teaches us how to live in his kingdom all that pertains to life and godliness. And not only that, he's made precious and magnificent promises. When I met my wife, I don't know where she got this habit, but if I told her something was going to happen, she said, you promise? kind of bothered me. I said, no. And she said, well, then don't say it. And I said, okay. And then it became kind of a little game. And if I said something and I remembered what she was going to say to me, I said, no, I promise. And if I didn't, she'd ask me if I promised. And guess what? There was a time or two I promised that I didn't deliver. And you know what she said to me? You promised. You know what? She couldn't have said anything that was more cutting than that in the world. She could have said, you're short, fat, ugly, and bald. And I said, I'm okay with that. 
But she said, you promised. And I had no answer for that. Because I had. But you know what the difference between me and God is? And if you don't, we're going to have to be here a long time tonight. The difference between me and God, the difference between you and God, is when God makes a promise, he keeps it. That's why they're called precious. That's why they're called magnificent. You remember when the Queen of Sheba went to see Solomon? Well, I don't mean you were there. <laughs> you remember reading that? And she comes back to talk about his wisdom and his money. And you know what she says? She says, the half has not been told. And that always impressed me. Because he was just a man. We sing a song that says, how beautiful heaven must be. The half has not been told. Do you realize of the people that died and came back from the dead, that were raised, not one of them ever said anything that was recorded about the other side? You realize that? They didn't say a word. But the half hadn't been told. And that's what we're promised. And shame on us for not realizing who promised it. And that's why the Bible was written. So that we'd have everything that we needed to make us complete as God's child. So that we would have everything that pertained to life and godliness and recognized it was backed by the promise of God. But there's a little more. That'd be enough, but there's a little more. The Bible it contains three basic sections. In the writing of the book of Isaiah, The writers of the book of Isaiah talk about, let's go to chapter 53. In chapter 53, we read what smart people call messianic prophecies. Messianic prophecy is a prophecy that's not going to be fulfilled right now, but it's going to be fulfilled in the future, and it's going to be filled by one who is called the Christ. Verse 7. After verse 6 says, We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of his all. He is oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like sheep silent before their shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. You could spend your time reading the 53rd chapter and, and find out all these prophecies. And, and that's what the first section of the scripture is about. The first section of the scripture exists because man sinned. From every tree in the garden you may freely eat, save for one, the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And they ate. In the, cloud, in, the, in the quietness and the calm and the coolness of the afternoon, God walked in the garden and he asked Adam and Eve where they were. And they said, We were naked. 
and we hid ourselves. And he says to them, did you eat of the tree? And you know what Adam said? She made me do it. The woman you created, she gave me the fruit, and I ate. Proving, proving that every man is more scared of his wife than he is God. Or that was what it appears. It wasn't his fault. It was hers, and indirectly God's. And when man sinned, sin entered the world. And because all sinned, sin passed to all men. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin in the sixth chapter is death. The first part of the Bible could be entitled, Jesus is Coming. You see, the problem that existed was a problem of sin. And the problem of sin brought about death, and the problem of sin brought about a consequence that God seemingly could not bear. And he said, I've got to save them. I've got to redeem them. I've got to bring them back. And Isaiah 53 talks about the Messiah being placed in a woman, becoming the Son of God, who wasn't much to look at, and nobody was going to be attracted to him because of his appearance. But he was going to be speak words by which men could be saved. Jesus is coming. You remember John as, as he writes and speaks about Jesus coming. You remember his cousin who says, I'm not fit to loosen his sandals. But in the book of John, the first chapter, John tells his disciples, the Spirit sat on that man. He's the one that you've been looking for. He's the one that I came to make way. And then he says, some of the most magnificent words that are ever spoken. I must decrease so he can increase. You know how many disciples Jesus had? You know how many disciples John had? A bunch. But John said, there he is. There he is. That's my cousin. When my mother was carrying me, I leaped for joy when I found out he was coming. And the time has come now for you to listen to him. I will decrease. He must increase. The first part, Jesus is coming. The second part, Jesus has come. Now, turn over to 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter. 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter. It's Paul writing again. And in verse 6 of the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, For it is only just for God to repay with affliction those that afflicted you, to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The first part is Jesus is coming. The second part is Jesus is here. And the third part is Jesus is coming back. And the reason he's coming back 
is to call those from the tomb to bring about resurrection. But Paul says here, it's only right, it's only just. Have you ever heard anybody say, a just God wouldn't send anybody to hell? A loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell? Second Thessalonians 1. It is only just to God to repay with affliction those who afflicted you. To bring about judgment on those that know not God and to those that obey not the gospel. Jesus is coming. Jesus has come. And Jesus is coming back. Now, you say, what in the world has that got to do with dinosaurs? Okay, here we go. In the book of Job, turn over to the 40th chapter. In Job, the 40th chapter, the writer of the book of Job is, Job is having a problem with God. He doesn't know why God seems to have turned his back on him. He won't tell him, God won't tell him what he's done wrong to bring about all these repercussions. In the 40th chapter, in verse 3, after the Lord answered Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. Then Job answered the Lord. Can you imagine this? <laughs> Job says, the one who contends, I mean, excuse me, God says, the one who contends with the Almighty let him speak. And Job says, believe I will. And Job answered the Lord, am I so insignificant? How can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not reply twice, but now I can add nothing. And then when you get down to the 40th chapter, when you get down to verse 14, he says, then I will confess to you that your own right hand can deliver you, God speaking. And in verse 15, he says, look at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like cattle. Look at the strength of his back and the power of the muscle of his belly. He, sit, he stiffens his tail like a giant cedar tree. The tenderness of his thighs are worn. The tendons of his thighs are woven firmly together. His bones are bronze tubes. His limbs are like iron rods. He is the foremost of God's work. Only his master can draw the sword against him. The hill yields food for him, while all sorts of wild animals play there. Here's what it has to do with dinosaurs. I don't know what a behemoth is. Nobody else seems to know either. There's educated guesses. They are those that suppose that it might be this or it might be that. But there's a couple things that you need to know about this. One is that the first English account 
of the New Testament and Old Testament, completely translated into English, occurred in the 1500s. The word dinosaur, which kind of has the meaning of like a wild dragon, but it didn't come into mean, it wasn't coined until the 1800s. So, is a behemoth a dinosaur? Don't anybody throw a songbook. Maybe. No. <laughs> Everybody woke up right then. And you say, how can you say that? Well, because maybe is a pretty safe answer most of the time. But here's what I want you to understand. There's a lot of animals that God created. Not all of them are even identified by name. Do you know the kangaroo is never mentioned in the Bible? And he doesn't hop up and down and get all mad about it. So I'm so sorry. Kangaroo's never mentioned in the Bible. That does not mean that there's not one. The elephant, the aardvark, the anteater, and no mention of penguins. I like penguins. I can look them in the eye. It wasn't that funny. But you know what? Here's the problem. Here's the problem. If you look at verse 15 in Isaiah 40, look at the behemoth, which I made along with you. God said, I made both of them. You and whatever that animal was. And the problem with dinosaurs is not whether they existed or not. I'm not real sure what a dodo bird is. But if that was what I was named, I'd want to be extinct too. Do you know there's a lot of animals that have come, been on the earth for a little while, and became extinct for whatever reason? Here's the problem. Let's, for the sake of discussion, say this is a dinosaur. There's a couple things you've got to deal with. Number one, God created it. It didn't evolve. God created it. And he created it when he created man. Remember we started out there on the fifth and sixth day? The problem with dinosaurs is they all existed 60 million years ago. You see, that's the problem. The problem is not whether a dinosaur or a dodo bird existed. The problem is whatever was a creeping animal upon the earth, a flying animal in the air, a creature of the sea, it was created in six days. And if you think that dinosaurs were created in the six days, you may be right. But the significance is not whether there was a dinosaur or not. That's not what the significance is. The significance is that if you say you believe in dinosaurs, 
you've got to believe that they were created 60 million years ago somehow. That's what the evolutionist says. And you see, that's the problem. The problem is you can't take A and match it with B and come up with C. You have to match it with 700,000 C's. Whatever was made was made in six days. And somebody says, oh, wait a minute now. You've forgotten that these dinosaurs' skeletal remains have been tested by the finest technologies that the world has to offer. in carbon dating and this kind of dating and that kind of dating. Go back to Genesis. In the first chapter and the second chapter. God created Adam and Eve. And he told them to be fruitful. To multiply. And they were only a couple days old. But they were able to do what adults, as a normal rule, after many years of life, can do. So I have a question. If God could create people that were full grown, if God could create people that had the appearance of being years older than the days that they had lived, why could he not create a world that looked a whole lot older than it was? And the answer is, he absolutely could. One more thing, because it's time to ring the first bell. One more thing. You remember Jesus teaching in parables? You remember that? And his disciples came to him and said, What? What does this mean? And Jesus said, To you it is given to know. To you it is given to know. These... I speak in parables so that they will not know. You say, why would Jesus have done that? In the book of 2 Thessalonians, again, the apostle Paul talks about there comes a point in time in people's lives where it's impossible to renew them to repentance. Their heart can't be touched. Pharaoh's an example of that in the Old Testament. God hardened his heart. And in some texts you read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In some texts you read Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. Whatever the case, whatever the day, the purpose was that if they were looking for something to lead them away from God, God was going to make sure it was available to them. If you want to follow after this, go ahead. Romans 1. They changed what God had created, and they worship the creature rather than the creator. You think this stuff is new? No. I don't have any problem believing in a dinosaur. I'm not saying emphatically that there were dinosaurs. But I'm telling you, I don't know what that animal was in Isaiah 40, but he had a tail like a cedar tree. I wouldn't want to come up on him. And guess what? He ate grass. But don't tell me that you found his skeleton and it's 60 million years old because God said in Isaiah 40, I created you and him at the same time. 
in six days. And you see, that's where people look at us and say, ah, fundamentalists, Bible thumpers. Okay, you have your dinosaur. Now what? Well, dinosaurs have been here for 60 million years. That's not what it says. I gave you a dinosaur, and you changed time. The battle is not in what's not there. The battle is in what is there. God said, I made him. And I made him when I made you. So the oldest either one of them could be is about 7,000 years old. That's pretty old. Beats Methuselah by a lot. But it still don't have any millions added on to it. You see, dinosaurs never were the answer. And they never were the problem. The problem was getting rid of God. And God said, uh-uh, I made both of you. Now what? Well, the dinosaur and the dodo bird both seem to be gone. Kangaroos didn't get any mention, and I don't know what happened to anteaters. But you see, the wisdom of God in Genesis, the first chapter, sea creatures, creatures that walk the earth, creatures that fly in the sky. Well, what are those? Name them. You can't do it. But what you do know, you do know what day they were done. And here's what you do know. You take a tool away from the person that wants to promote uh, evolution because you said there was a dinosaur. That's what you do. And remember, always say maybe. I don't know how many of you are here are always as, are, are as old as me, but I mean, when we came to that part of the story in the science books, my dad would write a note every year. Michael cannot sit down in any class with a dinosaur. I thought they were Satan's henchmen. I didn't know exactly what they were. But the most significant thing about understanding anything that anybody tries to propagate, they're not wrong about everything. And if you can agree with somebody in some regard that is based upon truth, then when they produce error, you're still promoting truth. Oh, you believe in dinosaurs? Yes, maybe. I don't know what a behemoth is, but he might be a dinosaur. But what I do know is God created both of them within six 24-hour periods. And neither one of them are hundreds or tens of hundreds or trillions of years old. If they're gone, they're gone just like the dodo bird. And nobody's getting excited about him.
right, children, I need your help again tonight. Let's, uh, let's all sing about what God has created, okay? Days of creation. believe it was 
Neil Armstrong that took out the Bible and started reading Genesis. And we watched that on pretty much black and white television. That would never happen today. We're too smart for that. And with that, goes away a lot of things of what the scripture talks about. And the scripture talks about basically three things. Jesus is coming. Jesus is here or has come. He's coming again. We've got the first two taken care of. The one that's significant now is he's coming again. And he extends an invitation to those that do not serve him. And just because we're here tonight doesn't mean we're serving him. It just means we're here. But maybe you've heard something, or maybe you've been contemplating rendering obedience to him. You have to, in initial obedience, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And we get to where we go through that so fast. <laughs> that we don't give it its due. But if you're here and you understand that the only thing that can produce faith is hearing, and faith convicts us to change, to serve the one we confess as Lord, with whom we're baptized into his death, raised in newness of life after having put him on and having our sins forgiven. If you understand that and you're subject to it, what hinders you from obeying? If you've obeyed the gospel of Christ and in some way you need to make your life right, you have the opportunity to do that, not because we're gathered together here, but because time still stands. We're on this side of judgment. I like stories. This one's an old one. There was a fellow, allegedly, that was wielding a sickle in a field, cold morning. And as he was wielding the sickle and cutting away that which he was trying to get rid of, he looked down, and there was a snake, all curled up and frozen. It was a talking snake, so you know it's a real story. And the snake said, don't kill me, I can't harm you. So the fellow picks the snake up. Sure enough, the snake broke. Puts it in his coat. And he goes back to wielding the sickle. Only one time, the swing is too hard. And he crimps the snake in between his arm and his body. And the snake had a reflex bite reaches in, he throws the snake to the ground. He raises the sickle up. He says, I spared you. I could have killed you when I first saw you. Why'd you do that? The snake looks up and he says, you knew I was a snake. snakes do you pick up knowing full well you never should have been. That's what the invitation of Christ is about. It's funny how quiet we've got for snoring story about a fake snake and a sick old wielding idiot. But yet when the invitation of Christ is just by, hey, we're gathered together, we've got to do this. Anybody wants to come, you can come. Put the snake down. You knew what it was when you picked it up. We're still on this side of judgment. We not got the promise of tomorrow for the rest of tonight. For the rest of this Sunday. Knew, knew I was a 
なこれ絶対聞きますこれ Now Accept the invitation of Jesus Christ Make your life right with Him And have Him be your home Your subject was no longer standing on I have decided to follow Jesus Uh, I know for those uh, here at the congregation, we studied this a couple of weeks ago, and just so you know, my mother says maybe now. <laughs> so don't all of you gang up on her at once. But we we did uh, greatly appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it's not just like Brother uh, Mike said, it's not the creation itself, it's what man has done to try to make the creation different. We see it each and every day in our lives, what men do with what God's given us. So uh, it's a good thing, it's a good place to start with somebody. Uh, a way, in the way of announcements, we have one more, one more night of vacation Bible study. Of course, we got visitors here tonight, and I know that you'll probably be at your home congregation tomorrow night, but Feel, feel free to uh, come back tomorrow night uh, for our last night of our va vacation Bible school. Uh, we're glad to see that Brother Ricky's out, able to be out with us. I know it's uh, hard for him. Uh, we made mention of him last night, especially with the kidney stones. He goes in July 9th uh, to try to have those broken up, removed. Uh, so let's, let's keep him in our prayers. Of course, he's having problems, uh, as we said last night, with his foot uh, and, and sciatic nerve. Uh, we won't continue to remember Tyler Barker's grandmother, uh, Sarah. She was in the hospital. Uh, Sister Liz, remember, went to get, uh, I think, results today at the dermatologist. I didn't get an update on that before services, but hopefully we'll have it for y'all tomorrow night. Uh, of course, all those that we've We've been mentioning Tim and Sherry. We're glad to see that Paul's able to be here tonight from the wreck that they had yesterday and uh, keep Mike, uh, their son, in your prayers as well. Um, that's really all that I have that needs to be mentioned. You have Christy Dennett up there? Oh, yes. And um, Wildersville is having a meeting this week from Sunday to Wednesday. Jerry Fast was sitting there on the back pew he went last night to Fowlersville, and Christy was at services. Oh, good. So she's still not communicating, but she was able to be up and out from service last night. Yeah, and I, I think she's uh, still going through the rehabilitation part, though, right? I told her everything yeah. I knew. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So she, I know she's uh, had a long, hard road to recovery uh, from the stroke that she had. Uh, we want to remember all those that are out of town uh, from us, but again, we're grateful for the presence of each and every one of you. We invite you back each and every opportunity you may have. Uh, if you are visiting with us and have not been here before, please, please leave a visitor's card for us so that we'll have uh, some record of your attendance. Again, thank you, and if you would, please at this time stand and we'll be dismissed in prayer. And since I failed to write down who it was going to be, I'm going to dismiss this in prayer. <laughs>
Please bow with me. Our great merciful Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity you have given us to gather here to study your word, Lord, to look at your creation in light of your word. And we pray, Father, that each and every day that we are thankful for those things that you have blessed each and every one of us with. For, Father, we have far more than we need. And we know, Father, that all these good things come from your hand. We pray each and every day that we use them in service to you. Always striving, Father, to be the people you'd have us to be. Help us each and every day to give glory and honor to your great and holy name. Please be with us until we come back again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.